Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, we're back after a long time and we're back with a really, really special guest today. My guest today is um, Gabrielle Tosfai. She's, um, she's an artist, she's a painter, and she's been strongly connected to the Tigra activism the past um, three years um, with, her, with her painting and a, a really, really interesting um, person and can't wait uh, for, for, for us to, to talk about what she has been doing, her paintings and what they, they mean to her and to her activism. And um, a warm, warm welcome to you, uh, Gabriel. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Um, so maybe I think you know, lots of my viewers wouldn't be familiar with the, with you. So I think it would be it would be good if, if we could start with you telling us a little bit about yourself. And we're going to get into them into your paintings. Mm -hmm. um, I am a painter, designer and filmmaker. Um, I'm currently based in Doha, Qatar, where I just completed my graduate studies. And um, I've been an artist all my life. This has been a lifelong passion of mine. And throughout majority of my life, my art has been inspired directly from the cultures that I come from. Um, I see art not just, not at all as just a decorative um, thing in a house, but art is a way of storytelling. It can also be a powerful tool for activism and it can be uh, an important tool for healing and for expressing um, culture and pain and stories that we have. Um, so that has been mainly my contribution to what has been happening at home and with the war. Um, I've used art as a way to do all of those things, activism, storytelling and healing for our people. Um, yeah. Yeah, and indeed, you have you have um, uh, explained those um, snippets of story that you just mentioned in your in your thesis, which was published, I think, a couple of um, days ago. And maybe tell us about what the main point of your of your. Um, um, I have read it, uh, but maybe tell our listeners what the, the main point of your um, thesis are. The, the thesis is titled. I'm going to add it to them. I'm going to put it in the description box for people to, to read it later. Um, but the title of the thesis is Foreigners Garden, uh, Preserving Tigran Culture During a Period of Ethnocide. Um, interesting title and a fascinating read. Um, and I would strongly recommend people to, to go through it. But tell us the main points in the, in the thesis. Mm -hmm. So like my title says, uh, Preserving Tigran Culture During a Period of Ethnocide. Um, I actually started this thesis um, and my research started in 2021 um, during, you know, the beginning of my graduate studies. And um, the main topic of it is cultural preservation. So, um, and I'm in a fine art school, an art and design school. So my challenge was to uh, respond to cultural preservation, which is a topic that I chose myself uh, through art and design. Um, so I researched a lot of different um, post-war societies all over the world, from uh, Syria to um, the Nazis in Germany to um, many different uh, communities all over the world that had their culture um, and heritage deliberately attacked uh, by the people that were oppressing them and when were committing genocide on their people. Um, and ways in which they were able to preserve their heritage um, on the ground or after the, their war ended. And I researched these to get inspiration onto how I can just contribute even a little bit to preserving Tigran culture, because as we know, uh, so much of our heritage has been destroyed the past two years um in the war and two years is not even a very long time but the amount of devastation our heritage has um suffered has been enormous like something that you would think would happen over many many years not just two years so for me this topic was like very urgent um it was urgent that research is done 
around this topic for Tigray specifically, and that work in this topic is uh, published and is um, starting to be spoken about in academic fields as well uh, for, for Tigray's sake. So yeah, that was the main, I could go on and on and on and on, but that was the main uh, focus of my project. Indeed, you, you choose um, you choose Jebena to, to tell your stories. And if I could summarize at least some aspect of your thesis, what happens is um, Jebenas have NFC, um, near field communication, and people could scan uh, the NFC and they would be redirected to, to your garden. And in the garden, they would get to see various aspects of um, to grind culture. I think that's broadly speaking what happens in, in, in terms of the main uh, body of work. Uh, and tell us why you, you chose um, Jebena as your main source of tool mm -hmm. for telling the, the stories and why you created uh, the, the, the garden, the floor in the gardens and what could people expect in the, once they have landed in the, in the gardens? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so yeah, like I uh, was saying, my main research was cultural preservation. So then I looked at, um, you know, the, the thesis that I'm supposed to deliver for my university, uh, which I come from a design program. So mainly we make, uh, we make objects, we do product design and we can, we study how we can tell stories and affect change through um, object making, uh, whether they be functional objects or poetic objects, but, um, yeah, uh, I was looking at all my research and I was like, what can I possibly make <laughs> with all of this information I have in front of me? Uh, before I chose the Jebana, um, I mean, there were so many objects from our culture that I could have chosen. I actually made an entire map, like a, a cultural heritage map of Tigray where I, um, it's like a mind map where I had all these different um, aspects of our cultural heritage. So I had um, religion, I had um, like religious sites like buildings, I had um, ancient monuments, I had um, manuscripts, I had cooking ware from Jebana to the pot that you use to make injera, to our textiles, to our jewelry. So there was so much inspiration I was going off of. And I chose to land on the Jebana for my project, um, not specifically like the Jebana is more important than any other ask, like thing in our culture, but I chose to use the object of a Jebana to tell a story. Um, I say that because I could have chosen any object to tell a story, but it was important for me for this project for just it being a beginning of a larger body of work that I will continue for the rest of my life. Um, Choosing the Jebana was significant because coffee for us is a time of exchange. It's when we are sitting down with friends or family and um, and having conversation. Um, it's very, 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 very old. I don't know. Do you know how many years, like how old the Jebana is, if you could like estimate? Or maybe you already know because you read my thesis. I don't, don't, don't put me on the spot. I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> Well, the Jovena is hundreds and hundreds of years old. Um, it's uh, originally found to have originated in the year uh, 1200. So it's very old and the, the ritual of coffee making um, and the Jovena was very fascinating to me um, that it's something that we still do to this day. And how it relates uh, to what's happening now is that we have like I said in the beginning, we have so much of our heritage um, and our culture that is being erased because of the war. Um, and and yeah, so I go into a lot of research as to why I chose the Jebana as well, um, it being a ritual that um, has been carried for hundreds of years and that the woman and the family have carried for hundreds of years. And I also talk about the role of women in Tigrayan society as well, linked to the coffee ceremony. Um, and also how coffee has played a unique role in the lives of diaspora around the world, um, continuing using the Jebana to make coffee, although they can have 
so many other coffee makers um, in Europe or in America that they could use, but people still use the Jabana and how it, it gives people a sense of home. So um, through each Jabana, I created it in a different uh, form. So I went away from the traditional form, which is usually like this, the traditional Tigrayan form. Um, this is a Jabana that you'll see in Tigray a lot with the one spout. Um, and I created it in different ways um, where I could story tell uh, stories and history to grind history on the Jevna through a painting, through abstracting the form. I made them all with clay uh, myself and painted them all myself and uh, put them in the kiln and everything I did on my own. And in addition to that, I embedded um, an NFC chip which like you said, NFC stands for Near Field Communication, um, which is a technology that a lot of people don't know about, but it's something we use every day. Like when you go to a store and you're able to tap your phone to pay at a grocery store or anything, uh, this is uh, NFC technology. So all of our phones have this reader of an NFC chip that is able to communicate with other NFC chips. So um, I was researching how can technology and traditional craft um, collaborate with each other um, in preserving culture and, and embedding stories into objects. So uh, you're able to scan your phone on the Jevenos I created on that chip that I embedded, and it will automatically take the viewer into an archive that I've titled Proena's Garden. Um, so it's an archive and a garden of different um, information, of to grind history. So when you scan the Jebana with your phone, it will automatically take you to that specific page that that Jebana is, um, the history that it is um, representing. So I know I talked a lot, so I'll stop now. <laughs> Um, not at all, not at all. I was, I was gripped. Um, and uh, it's actually, I think it's, it's brilliant, the idea of connecting um, cultural craft to technology. And in our case, the idea of connecting Jevenam, sort of a mainstay thing in, in grand cultures to technology. And I'm, I'm not artistic, so it's not an idea that I would have come up with. But when I was going through the thesis, I was actually taken aback by, by the idea of, well, that's, that's, um, that's a smart thing to, to do. And I strongly encourage uh, our listeners to, to read the, the thesis because there are lots of accounts of, as well of interviews that you have done with people of um, literature review that we have done in terms of um, how historically a lot of cultures have been erased and what cultural erasure means to the sense of identity of various communities and what could happen to us um, to grants and what other things that we should do to preserve. And I think that your thesis is part of that attempt to, to, to for, for preservation. Yeah. And um, another thing that you 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 talk in the um, in the uh, that you mentioned in the thesis is the process of learning to to craft um, Jevenas and the steep learning curve that you you had had to do. Um, Tell us that, I mean, it, it might seem kind of insignificant, but actually for people who are interested in, in art, maybe it could be interesting uh, to know the, the process and making um, Jebena and how difficult it was for you and how you how you found the, the entire process generally. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I have one of them here. <laughs> and it was very, very difficult. And here's the NFC chip that I was talking about. So I have them on the handle and then I have everything. So it was very difficult, but it was also very therapeutic. I mean, art for me is my career, but it's also, I mean, I chose a career that I genuinely love. Um, and it's, it was very therapeutic working with clay. Um, I mean, I know that in Tigray, from my research that I've done, um, I mean, I've never met a person who makes Shabanas, but I've found maybe like one or two short articles and books from a long time ago that talk about uh, like pottery makers in um, just Ethiopia in general. It's not like a career that is like put up high or anything, <laughs> but um, 
it was very humbling to learn how to work with clay and to make this object that we that is so important important to every household like every household has a jevna but nobody really knows how it is made or how to or you know whatever make one um but it was very enjoyable and it was also very enjoyable um painting on them because i i'm not a clay maker uh professionally i'm i'm a painter and a, and a designer um and I was actually going to take the designs I made and give them to a clay maker to make them for me um, because I come from a design school. So we, you know, we know how to use different technology like 3D rendering, 3D printing. We know how to use different machinery and we know how to design objects. But then we give that design to a maker who will make it for us. But in this case, out of everyone in my pro in my program, I made my project on my own. I designed it and I made it on my own. And that was very important for me because I could have given it to a clay maker in, in Qatar, but they wouldn't have known the importance or felt the importance of what a Gemini meant to me. Um, and so, yeah, it was just very important for me to make them on my own with mm. my own hands. And yeah, working with clay is just so, I mean, I recommend it anyone who <laughs> if you live somewhere that has a pottery studio it's just a very like therapeutic thing to work with I don't know because you're like working with um natural materials or working with um you're you're turning a lump of dirt literally clay is just dirt from the ground um into a beautiful art piece um that you can use so even though I'm having my coffee and a cup that I made and it's very satisfying so yeah Brilliant. Um, what you, you say that art is therapeutic for, for, for you, and I think it would be for, for many people, especially people who have a predisposition to, to art. And I think people who follow you on Twitter would immediately notice that art is your primary means of um, expression, of communication. Yeah. Um, and it looks like that you use art to, um, to channel whatever feeling it is that you're having inside, and especially um, as it relates to Tigray, to the suffering that uh, has been visited on the people of Tigray, you used art to uh, to communicate uh, what you have been feeling and to do activism in, in, in general. I'm just wondering how how did you come interested in in art? What was the 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 journey like? Um, that the journey that that uh, made you end up being fascinated by by art and not just fascinated but also wanting to make a career out of it mm -hmm. well you know how when you're young and um you're playing with different toys or you know kids they play with toys they play with crayons coloring books all different things ever since i was a child like playing with different paints and and crayons and whatever um, I was like hooked on art from the very beginning. So I was making art as a regular, you know, project that they give to kids in school. But I took it very, very seriously from a very young age. So when we were given a project in school to like paint, I don't know, a flower, I was very serious <laughs> on the way that I was painting my flower. And I took it very seriously. And I, um, I, yeah, I just loved art from a very early age. And I decided when I was um, seven that I would do art for the rest of my life and there's nothing else that I want to do. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's the short of it. <laughs> yeah, and part of, the, part of the, that journey was um, um, going to, to Qatar, to, to Doha, to do uh, master's, the, the master's thesis that we mentioned earlier. And just to slightly step out of the, the, the content of your thesis and just for you to reflect um, on your time in, in Doha and um, how it was like for, for someone like you from the US to, to go to, to Doha and do master's degree. What was, what was that like for, for you? Um, it was, I mean, I just graduated like three weeks ago, so it's still very fresh, like reflecting on it. But 
yeah, this has been, I mean, it's just, it was a life-changing experience. I never thought I'd ever live in Doha, um, but this program was recommended to me by a friend. Um, I went to Virginia Commonwealth University School of Arts and of Qatar, and um, it's an amazing university. And um, I received a fellowship that allowed me to study there for the two years and get my degree. Um, and yeah, it's uh, Doha uh, culture in general. It's very, um, I think a lot of people don't know what it's like until they actually travel there because I know there are a lot of, um, you know, certain perspectives when it comes to living in Arab countries, especially as a woman. And um, no, it's probably the safest country I've ever lived in. Um, I would like to continue living there and even like settle myself there. Um, it has a lot to offer. I mean, as a creative person, the museums, the way that every building and every, even like the metro station, the way that everything is designed so intentionally and beautifully was just very inspiring for me. Um, yeah, it just, um, yeah, it was an amazing, just an amazing chapter of my life that I've just finished. Uh, hmm. yeah. yeah, I think you, you mentioned that people have mistaken perceptions and perspectives about Arab countries. And I think you, you'd be right. And, um, you know, from time to time, I do think if I am myself a victim of the propaganda that we, we you know, that we, we get um, um, from, from the mainstream media in terms of what life is like, especially for women and especially for someone like you who seems to be very expressive, um, not just um, in terms of you wanting to do art and paint, but also outwardly um, expressive. And, you know, what we constantly hear about Arab country is that there is a strict sort of adherence to a certain way of doing things and a certain way of uh, dressing and a certain way of being generally and a certain way, a very specific way of comporting yourself in, in public. And the reason I asked you was whether or not that was um, the case for you, but it, it doesn't look like you've had any issues and if anything it looks like it's it's um it's it's, uh, it's something that you thoroughly enjoyed yeah and i i can't and i haven't traveled to every single arab country so i can't speak for like the entire region in general uh which wouldn't be right because every country is unique within itself uh just like just like um East Africa, <laughs> you know, if, if someone were to say that, I don't know, Tigray is just like Eritrea, we'd be like, it's seasoning, you know, it's, it's not like this. So the world is very diverse and travel is something that is a part of my life and who I am. Um, I've traveled a large part of the world from Asia to Europe to now um, the Middle East. So yeah, I I have I have um, a love for just people and the world and and countries. Um, but yeah, I I really enjoyed my time in studying in Doha, um, and I know that my identity is um, something that maybe is a bit unique. I mean, when people see me, they see they don't see like an American right away. They probably are looking like, where is she from? A lot of people, you know, they think maybe I am, I don't know. They, they guess a lot of places as to where they think I'm from. I will say that there are a lot of um, Arab countries that do have this kind of, uh, they'll judge you based upon your nationality, like the passport that you hold. Um, and they may treat you a certain way based upon that. Um, so yeah, I, I can't speak for like every, every person's experience, uh, there. Um, uh, so that's something I'm mindful of as well. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, that was, uh, that was a minor, uh, digression into, into, into Arab. I think, you know, some people would find it fascinating to, to, to listen to you speak about what life is like in 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 Kotam and and generally your experience, how your study was, and uh, what you what you learned. 
but you, you mentioned identity, um, Gabriel, and I think, you know, one thing that our listeners might be interested to um, to hear you talk might be your connection with um, Tigray, which is sort of the main reason we are, we are here as well in terms of your painting and what you have been doing to Tigray. And you said that you're American, you were born in America as far as I yeah, uh, no. So th tell us your connection to, to Tigray um, as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm connected to Tigray through my father. Uh, my father is from Tigray. My mother is from Jamaica. So I come from a multicultural background. Um, and like I said in the beginning, um, my art has kind of steered the way of my life path and what I make work in and where I travel to. So I've traveled to Ethiopia multiple times. And um, the last time I was in Ethiopia in 2020, before the pandemic happened, I was in Tigray visiting my family. And um, yeah, it was an amazing time. So. Yeah, when the war happened, of course, it changed everything because after my visit to Tigray, I had, you know, a lot of aspirations to go back. I mean, I, I, I'm, to describe my life, I'm constantly traveling. So I'm in a different place, like every six months. I love experiencing new places and being like, you know, this is my time in my life where I'm like young and I'm just traveling everywhere and then figuring out where do I want to just stay. But um, yeah, my plan before the war was to go back to Tigray and, you know, just spend a lot of time there. And, and um, but yeah, of course I wasn't able to do that, but, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm connected to Tigray through my father and through my family there. Um, yeah. Mm. Yeah, so interesting, um, Gabriel. I think um, one one thing that I I'm curious to know, in the light of what you have been doing the past uh, the past three years in terms of the painting, uh, and because you were painting stories that are um, painful, um, again without being an artist, something that I think happens in inside you is you have to. At some degree, empathize with the with the um, with the people whose story you are having to tell through your painting, and I wonder what that has meant to you to grant identity in terms of creating a stronger bond because you're having to experience the pain insofar as you could through your your painting and what that does to your um, to your sense of identity, especially for someone who didn't grow up in Tigray, but who has a sense of connection that comes from from intellectually know, knowing that, you know, that is your root and and that that is your people going through the thing that you're trying to, to tell. Um, I don't know if I'm clear, but yeah. tell us about that. Yeah. So, yeah, it's interesting. Of course, I am born and raised in America and um, I spent majority of my life in the US and I didn't grow up in Tigray. And so it's interesting coming from, and also having one parent who's Tigrayan and one parent who's not, you know, one parent who's from a completely different uh, world and history and, um, and family. So yeah, it, um, it's very, it's interesting because I feel as an artist and as a storyteller um, and as a, t a Tigrayan, I have a responsibility first to um, amplify awareness of what is happening. And this is what the responsibility uh, collectively was felt through um, all uh, diaspora, all Tigrayan diaspora. Majority of all of us were in some way um, a part of activism in whatever way that made sense to us. So you have people who started organizations, people who work in um, healthcare, who are doctors and nurses, and that's where their work was, people who work in government, and that's where their work was. And I'm an artist, so my work was in um, creating art about Tigray. Um, and a lot of, 
I mean, a lot of us in the diaspora, the past three years for us has been um, longing to hear the voice of our families, wishing we could call them and check up on them, seeing if they're okay, having no idea where they are, um, watching terrible videos and seeing terrible photos of the inhumane uh, violence that has been happening and a lot of people responding to this in, in various ways and an individual even experiencing the feelings of all of this happening in various ways. Um, sometimes, some days it's depression, some days it's um, extreme motivation and determination um, to make a difference. Um, some days it's extreme anger um, of the world not caring and not doing anything um, when they could. And, and some days it's hope. So I feel all of these feelings I put into my artwork. Um, and when you are a diaspora doing, working in whatever field it is that you're working in to amplify awareness and to help people in your homeland, you have to have a sense of stripping your ego from it entirely. Um, and I feel as an artist, uh, this is something that, I don't know, I was an artist working in a field of wanting to affect change in a humanitarian sense. It's extremely important to strip your ego from things and to practice what I call radical altruism, which is you're, you're doing entirely what you're doing uh, for the sake of, of people and um, in a sense being nameless in what you're doing. So. Um, when I share my art online, when I share a film, I know that I am taking that art piece from my heart and I'm putting it out into the world and now it belongs to the world. You know what I mean? And that art could circulate everywhere and that art may be on the phone screens of people, that art has been printed and sold for money, um, money that has been raised to then send back home to feed people, to buy supplies, to help people. So um it's like uh it's like an energy that is just constantly um circulated in order to make to make change and i know that's a very like intangible way of of speaking about it but that's kind of what it is i mean everything that we're doing as a collective diaspora um being devastated by what's happening but not experiencing it on our own because experiencing death and pain and war in front of you is an entirely different experience um and i mean our parent a lot of our parents have experienced it because they've lived through war before and they so many of them have escaped as refugees and that's why so many of us are here in america or in europe um my father was a refugee uh, like so many other of uh, majority of all of my all of the parents of my friends who have grown up here in the U.S., all of my Tigrayan friends, all of their parents were refugees. A lot of them born in Sudan in refugee camps. So, a lot of them do know what it's like to have that experience. And I think a lot of us also are channeling not the pain, not just the pain of what's happening now, but the pain of our parents our parents went through this already. Our parents have actually experienced this. They've seen terrible, terrible things. Um, and they raised us um, still recovering from what they had, from what they had experienced, whether they're conscious of it or not. Um, so yeah, that's something that I think I also have in my art. Being an artist, I'm extremely empathetic and I feel feel the pain of people like very, like it's my own, um, while also humbling myself knowing that it's not my own. Um, so it's like a balance of putting everything I can into an art piece so that it can connect and be felt uh, to, the, to thousands of people. Um, and knowing that what I'm doing is, you know, it's something that you have to, um, yeah, have a balance of 
in order to keep doing it. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah, you, you, I mean, it's interesting that you, you mentioned the diaspora and what people in the Tigran diaspora will have been feeling the past um, three years, the trauma, the pain, and the, 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 the sense of uh, being separated from, from something that you value. And indeed, in your thesis, you write about interviews that you have done with people. Um, you ask them about what are some of the things that come to their mind when they think of, of, of Tigray. Uh, and I think one of the um, answers you, you got, it, they, the first thing that comes to their mind is the sense of social life, the sense of connection that they were not able to, to have then. And since I'm the, the interviewer and the, you are the interviewee now, now, I'm going to ask you that what you feel when you think about Tigray as an artist, I'm, I'm sure your, what you feel is going to be slightly different maybe. And how do you, how do you expect to, to, to express what, what you feel? Um, I'm, I'm sure it's going to be some form of um, art, or painting and, and craft and, and, and stuff like that. But first, the, the, the first one, what do you feel when you think of Tigray now? When I think of Tigray, I think of my family there. That's the first thing, you know, I think of my family. Um, and yeah, I think of their faces. I think of, I, I just think of, of them directly, like the people that I have there, my, my family members. And, and that's, an interesting thing because one thing that kept coming up when I was interviewing people for research for my thesis was, um, you know, like I was researching cultural heritage preservation and heritage are like, they're things, you know, they're, um, and they're important, but they are, they're, you know, old buildings and manuscripts and objects and, and Bibles and mosques and, you know, there's so many different uh, things. But the the reason why we have these things is because the people who made them, the people who created them, the people of the past and the people of the present, and the people of the future, the Tigrayans who are not yet born, um, who will continue to to create um, objects that that um, contribute to to the, the continuation of Tigrayan heritage. So, um, yeah, it's it's number one the people. Uh, and when I think of Tigray, the first thing I think of is my family, um, straight away, like straight away, probably because I'm always thinking about them anyway, all the time, <laughs> like all the time throughout the day. Um, so, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So, so for instance, a writer would, would uh, try to express what they are feeling through writing normally. And when you think of all of your family and you want to convey something either to them directly or just to them, to the outside world in terms of what you're feeling internally. I'm just trying to understand the, the thought process that goes through inside an artist's mind. What, what, what are the things that come to your mind? How do you, how do you think to, to, to express those very deep familial um feelings hmm. i guess for example i have a painting one of my favorite paintings that i've created uh the past two years has been a painting of a man and a woman embracing each other and behind them they have um like their their city on fire um, and smoke coming from the, the skyline and you can tell that they have just escaped um, a terrible situation and they're embracing each other um, and when I was creating this painting I guess what I you know for one I was thinking of how much I'm, I'm yearning uh, for my family and, and wishing I could check on them to see if they are okay and then I was relating that feeling I was feeling to what people must be feeling in Tigray. Um, and then I was even thinking about, um, I was just going through all of the possible um, experiences that people were having. Um, for example, like people who were just starting a life together, uh, young people who just had a baby, um, 
a young person who was just about to graduate college, like I was thinking of all of the life stories that were being uh, disrupted because of the war and and painting them. And, you know, as you see in my paintings, I paint a lot of people. I paint a lot of portraits. I paint a lot of um, uh, scenes depicting, depicting people uh, doing things, whether it be uh, in their home or with family, you know, I paint a lot of stories that are depicting people together or a person alone. So I think a lot of it is just if I'm translating an emotion to a physical art piece to a painting, it's painting really like what we would consider to be mundane moments, like giving a hug to a person. But when you paint it, you're painting the emotion of a moment like that. So if I'm painting the embrace of a mother and a, and a son that have not seen each other in three years because of the war, I'm painting every detail of what that moment might feel like. Um, the tears coming down her face, the wrinkles under her eyes, the what is the color of sadness and what is the color of extreme happiness and despair and you know I you can you can give a color and a shape to these emotions and I think this is what I this is like the magic of being an artist and you're creating a picture of something that you could take a photo of I can take a photo of two people hugging um, and photos photography also tells so much of a, of a story as we've seen the past three years all of the different photos that have come out of, of Tigray, um, but yeah, a painting tells the same story, but with different, uh, just different symbolism. And, um, and paintings can also paint things that we can't take a picture of. Like I paint also a lot of otherworldly things like angels that we can't see with our eyes, but we can feel and, um, and yeah, I, I, I paint a lot of different symbolism, um, collaborating with like real world things as well in order to, to, tell, to tell stories and to express emotion. Hmm. Well, I, I think people who follow you on Twitter will know the kind of paintings um, that you're speaking about. And um, one thing that I will tell our listeners now is if you don't follow Gabrielle Freund on Twitter. You should you should follow her. I'm going to put your 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 link to to Twitter Twitter handle um at this call on on the description box. So um, expect an upside of, of followers soon. Um and if I could if I could show you know some people who don't know you the kind of painting that you're talking about. I don't know. Maybe there could be some copyright issues, but I'm going to take my chance. Uh, so I'm going to share this. All right. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Hmm. Doesn't seem. Let me try. Um. Sure. All right.
Uh, we're able to see the screen, Gabriel. All right. I hope it's it's, it's working in the in the recording because I'm not sure. I wasn't seeing anything. So, but anyways, it's just powerful um, the way that a lot of stories that I don't think would have been possible to to be captured in words or in pictures, like you said, um, just wonderful and beautiful and so um, moving. I'm, I'm going to. Uh, put a link to the to the to that um, montage clip as well. But thank you for for doing that. Um, I think it's so um, powerful and just goes to show the the power of um, painting, the sheer power of what you could the story that you could tell through um, painting. So to to take it back to to um, um, chat, Gabriel. Um, is there any central sort of database or repository where people could go and see your paintings? I, I know that people could follow you on Twitter and see um, this, most of the painting that you pose. And also another place would be your thesis because you put lots of paintings in, in there. But um, I'm just wondering if there is another um, database where people could just go and um, sort of gallery and, and um, indulge themselves in. Yeah, my website. Your website, all right. Okay. Awesome. So, great. Okay. So, um, I'm going to ask you sort of philosophical question that you yourself had raised in your in your thesis. You say that can you plant a garden to stop a war? And and what is your answer? C can you? I think when I um, put that question in my thesis, it's actually a quote from um, from an uh, article that I found that talks a lot about uh, gardening as a therapy for people who are healing from devastating life experiences. Um, and I titled my thesis for Wayne's Garden. And it was also inspired by um, the gardens that have started in Sudan at the refugee camps that a lot of Tigrayan refugees live in. Um, and this is a lot of work that uh, the organization uh, Hab in Tigray, they've helped in creating a lot of gardens um, in, the refugee, in the refugee camps so that people can grow their own food um, and, and be um, sustainable. But it's also a question that is uh, very metaphorical. Uh, and it's something that I ask people in my interviews. Um, I ask them, if you could plant a seed in Tigray that could grow into anything you wanted, what would it be? And this gave various answers where people would say, oh, I would plant a seed of protection so that Tigray would always be protected. I would plant a seed of libraries full of all of our history so that children could grow up knowing their history uh, that is, you know, being erased. I would plant um, uh, homes that can never be destroyed. You know, people had a lot of creative answers to this question. Um, and so I put that question in my thesis because I do feel like all of the dreams that we have uh, that hopefully uh, people will keep alive within themselves. Uh, I metaphorically see them as seeds that we have to continue to water in order to reach and have to grow into this, you know, beautiful place that we want to rebuild and reconstruct, that we want to heal, um, and that we want to live in peacefully again. So. It's also kind of a metaphor of planting seeds of healing within your own self, uh, because I think a lot of people have had to, even when a war is finished, people are still going through trauma. Uh, the war is still happening inside of them because they have been through so much, uh, especially you know the children who their, their first memories of their life now will be a war. Um, how will that affect them as, you know, when they turn into adults and even when they reach their teenage stage, like you have children who are not even five years old yet, where their first memories of their home is war. Um, and women that have been through terrible things and young men that have stopped 
their studies to 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 fight for to fight in this war and um not feel like they their sacrifice was for what really because they're not being treated with the respect that they deserve um so the war is still going in in the hearts and the minds of of the people who have suffered and are still suffering um so I feel it is a part of my responsibility to plant seeds of healing um, to stop these wars that are still uh, ravaging within the, you know, the minds of people who have been through so much. Um, but yeah, I do believe that seeds can stop wars. I believe that healing is possible, even for people who have been through the most terrible things that you can imagine. And I, you know, this is a strong belief of mine um, that that people deserve to live a beautiful life despite having gone through the worst things that you can imagine in the history of humankind and that it's possible for them with collective effort and complete altruism um, to, to make possible. So yes, I I do believe in that. Hmm. Well, that's a that's a powerful and um, optimistic um, uh, message. Um, I could only share in that optimism. And you you you've named your your garden Froini Garden, and people who might be wondering, Froini was the Tigrinya name given to you. And in the thesis, you say that it's also a name that your um, grand. Uh, mother or grandfather liked and so there's a um, there's a story if you want to tell us something about that uh, please by all means mm -hmm. I remember a long time ago my father who also really likes the name Fellini and that's why he named me Fellini um, he also saw that his mother really liked that name um, and yeah I feel a sense of pride that uh, this is my name and so growing up uh, Habasha would call me Froini and Americans would call me Gabrielle. So I kind of always had two names. Um, both names are on my document as like my two names. So depending on where I am, it depends on the name that I'm called, but they are both my name. And this is why I chose to title my thesis Froini's Garden in honor of that. Also, the name Fellini, if you break it down, I feel really relates to this idea of a garden and planting seeds, of course, because Fre is seed and Wayne is grape. Um, and yeah, so poetically, I just felt like it matched a lot. Um, and yeah, I very much like my name. Hmm. Well, thank you for the, um, you know, for the deeply moving paintings that you have done in the past. Um, three years, I, I think they are very powerful, and uh, um, I uh, I strongly recommend people to go um, and see your paintings and be inspired and and be moved by, by them. And um, that would be that for for today. But if you have some final words or words of advice that you might want to say to people who care about cultural preservation and to people who might be interested to know. Um, what has happened in terms of the cultural ethnocide, which is a word that you use in your thesis. Um, if you have some words about those um, issues, please, um, uh, the floor is yours. Mm -hmm. I would say that it is extremely important um, that we continue researching and adding to different academic databases all over the world um, and putting into writing what has taken place in Tigray and how important it is for cultural preservation in Tigray to be uh, preserved and taken seriously and have different international organizations um, work on the ground and helping to preserve culture that has that is there because um, from all the researching I was doing and even all the presentations that I did at my university the past two years um, to audiences that knew nothing <laughs> about the war and about um, how significant our heritage is in Tigray. Um, you know, I, I was explaining to them that it's not just Tigrayan history, it's world history, it's the history of humanity and a lot of the heritage that you have in Tigray and a lot of the artifacts 
um, that you find are some of the oldest in the world. And so why, why should this not be taken seriously and why should it not be preserved? So it's extremely important that people who are interested in researching cultural heritage to um, not be afraid in, in making statements and, and speaking about this to the different, um, to the different uh, audiences that you are in front of. Um, and, and yeah, um, yeah, I think that there, there's a lot of work to be done, but it's, for me, it's, it's exciting. Um, it's, uh, something I, I look forward to and I can't wait to go back and to continue studying on the ground there and, and going to places and researching them and, um, even all the different archeo archeological and anthropological uh, work that can be done in Tigray is just like limitless, I feel, and amazing. Um, and more people really, really need to know about it because yeah, nothing else compares to it. So our land has a lot of unique and amazing history to, to offer and to share. Thank you very much, um, Froini. Thoroughly enjoyed it, and I hope our listeners are going to enjoy it as well. And um, to our listeners, thank you for um, staying with us. Thank you for listening to this. And if you like uh, what you're doing, please um, do like and share and spread um, our videos around to friends and to connections. And uh, I have been Taklai. Goodbye. What dinner? <laughs> going to stop